She is a fighter for the people, so much so that she's famous for not buying the bullshit of the official made-up 9-11 story by the government, was the leader in the post-2008 days, where Wall Street and the government colluded to create the biggest wealth transfer ever from the ordinary people like us to the elite and has now collaborated with Robert David Steele, and in this interview I'm telling you, she's leaving it all on the floor. Cynthia McKinney is a unique fighter for truth. You'd be stunned, absolutely shocked by the truth. Enjoy the interview, and be sure to access the critical bonus report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash C. That's the letter C. It's vital. Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are continuing to bring you the real news that is shaping the future of our country that no one ever sees on mainstream media. And today we are welcoming one of the co-founders of Hashtag Unrig. We interviewed Robert David Steele of this same organization about one month ago for a bombshell show. His information is covered in our free report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Robert. G. Edward Griffin joined us a few weeks ago to bring us up to date on the Federal Reserve, which is continuing to devour American banking. His report can be found at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash G. Bob Moriarty showcased the rise of socialism in our interview. His report is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Bob. And Charles Hughes Smith, focused upon the wealth gap, which is the widest that our country has ever known. His report is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Smith. Today, it is my honor and privilege to be welcoming to the show the former U.S. Congresswoman of Georgia, Dr. Cynthia McKinney. Dr. McKinney served six terms in the United States House of Representatives. She is a former Democrat who aligned with the Green Party in 2008 and ran for president in that year. Her viewpoints are strong from 9-11 to Libya and many other explosive topics and we are going to go there. Cynthia, I am incredibly <laughs> honored to be welcoming you to the show. How are you today? Well, I'm doing just fine, and my goodness, I need to tune into your show because you've got some gangbusters go going on in your history there. <laughs> I tell you what, we've got some people, including yourself. We are so, I am so privileged to be welcoming. You know, as a side note, and this is just my personal opinion, you are one of the people that actually laid the groundwork for the non-corporate, truth-seeking news coverage that today we call the alternative media. And as I mentioned, you were a Green Party candidate for president in 2008. And I just want to briefly share with everybody Cynthia's four agreed upon principles for her presidential platform in 2008. It's going to give you a window into the ethics of this lady. Number one, it was to end the Iraqi war. Number two, it was to safeguard privacy, including a call to repeal the Patriot Act. Number three, no increase in the national debt. And number four, a thorough investigation, evaluation, and audit of the Federal Reserve. So I think that brings everybody up to date on why I am so incredibly honored. Cynthia, we want to start off with one of the topics that you were most critical of, and that was the formal inquiry into 9-11. What do you really think happened that day? And take us back to the month and years before that and after that, that aftermath. What is the truth as you see it? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's a We're huge with question. A big one. I know. <laughs> you here. We're going for it. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. But okay, so uh, my experience, basically, say if we start around 2000, just prior to the events of 2001. So basically. We had the presidential election in 2000, remember? That's such a long time ago. But we had the presidential election, and we also had, um, which was very important in my world, the World Conference Against Racism. So in 2000, you had a lot going on. And, <clears throat> and um, of course, the problems that arose 
from the 2000 presidential election or problems that I would never forget. And that were first and foremost on my mind where we actually were able to witness election theft in action. And um, so the, <clears throat> the state of Florida uh, had gone through its thing. And remember it was Florida that gave George W. Bush the presidency. So this was huge and in a, it was a contested election. So we had that going on. Then hot on the heels of that kind of fraud and at the same time, we're bombing other countries because we were bombing Iraq, remember? Um, then there was the World Conference Against Racism going on down in South Africa, the sponsorship of the United Nations. And so you had all of the peoples of the formerly colonized world being able to come together under the auspices of the United Nations and say, okay, this is the kind of world that we want to see. And these are the things that need to happen in order for us to have that more perfect union and that better world. Okay. And then that was around August, the World Conference Against Racism. And then we all know what happened in September. September to September 11th, 2001. So we, we had a, a series of events that were jarring and jolting to us, we, to we the people. And we had to figure out a way to put it all into some kind of perspective with a narrative that made sense for what we were uh, in the process of, ex process of experiencing. And basically, unfortunately, there were a lot of lies, just outright lies coming from the government, starting with George W. Bush asking the U.S. Senate at the time to not investigate September 11th. Then you had, remember, Dick Cheney, Darth Vader Cheney, and he also was doing the same thing. Now, this is what got me into trouble because I, I, I understood that whenever there is like a, say for example, uh, railroad crashes, um, uh, an airplane crashes or something within the transportation sector happens, then immediately, you've got the National Transportation Safety Board springing into action and they have subpoena power, investigative power, they have the power to do the investigation and if there is a, um, a technology malfunction or a mechanical malfunction, they find it, they root it out and they root it out of the transportation grid completely. So they are able to ground airplanes, do whatever it takes in order to make sure that whatever that tragedy was, it won't happen again in that way. So everybody in uh, <clears throat> the government was saying, well, we don't want this tragedy of September 11th to happen again. Well, of course we don't want it to happen again. But how can you say that you don't want it to happen again when you're not ready or willing to do an investigation into exactly what happened so that you can prevent it from happening again? Well, this was very logical to me, a logical way of thinking. And instead, we were given these talking points from, uh, they just mysteriously appeared on our um, congressional desk. And... Um, it uh, said uh, we were hit because we were free. And you remember George W. Bush said we were hit because we were free. Everybody was saying we were hit because we were free because they had been given the talking points that that's what they had to say. Instead of what I did, unfortunately for me, <laughs> because it brought the wrath of Khan down on me, <laughs> I said, well, where's the National Transportation Safety Board? Yeah, what's <laughs> have an independent investigation into what happened. If you don't want it to happen again, then let's find out what exactly did happen. That was terrible because that was not uh, permitted. And so therefore began my 
personal political travails because I wanted to get to the root truths of what had happened on September 11. The truth. Exactly. Now, you know, you kind of went rogue a little bit. And yes. I love it. And trust me, we all love it. Looking back now in <laughs> retrospect, we were like, where were our other lone wolves on that time? But you actually introduced um, the articles of impeachment against yes. President George W. Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Secretary yes. of State Condoleezza Rice, alleging, among other things, that they somehow manipulated intelligence in order to justify the war. Now, that bill did not make it past the House committee, so many people don't realize that that even happened. But tell us about the atmosphere at that time, because as you're going rogue, as you are yes. the lone wolf out there and everyone's just yes. staring at you going, oh my God, you know, and you're saying, right. Uh, well, let's check this out. Yeah. Well, you know, basically <clears throat> I listened to, well, the, the line was the line that was used was well, there were many lines that were used, but like probably the most potent was she's unpatriotic, you know, you, um, and now is not the time. And so I listened, sadly, quite frankly, to a radio program. I happened to have been driving through middle, middle South Georgia, and I, uh, there was a, very, very strong signal radio station there. And so I had the opportunity to listen. Georgia is my home state and people there <clears throat> know me, but, but um, <clears throat> it was an opportunity for people to demonize me. Mm. And I had been thoroughly, totally demonized for asking for an investigation. I actually wrote an op-ed that appeared in... Uh, I believe it appeared in the Atlanta newspaper. It might also have appeared in the Washington Post, but the Washington Post was the first. It was the, the journalist by the name of Juliet Alperin who def definitely demonstrated that she was a part of the deep state because she was the one that used the cons conspiracy theory thing, you know. And um, so it was just horrible. And this is because I wanted an investigation. And I was shocked at the number of people in the U.S. who also said they didn't want an investigation. <laughs> well, who were criticizing me. Now, I understand I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm Southern. And so, therefore, I, there, there's a lot of targets there that you can poke at. Oh, yeah. And um, people who had credibility, who were basically white men, Mm -hmm. were able to poke at my credibility. And so they created a caricature of me so that my former governor, who also was a former senator of the state of Georgia, called me loony. And then we had another senator from, the Georgia, from Georgia who said, um, well, I know for a fact that she doesn't know what she's talking about. And so, and that was uh, Max Cleland, who was the senator at the time from Georgia. When he lost his bid for reelection, then my, um, uh, he was tapped to serve on the 911 commission. And he, <laughs> he quickly resigned because he too found out that um, he didn't know what he was talking about when he criticized me for not knowing what I was talking about. Quite frankly, I knew what I was talking about. I understood quite, fr I understood from I immediately that we had a problem. I didn't know what, you know, what had happened, but I did know that what I saw on my television screen was not the full story of what had happened. And I also knew that um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the reticence of Dick Cheney and George W. Bush to have an investigation into what we saw on our television screens indicate was an indicator that was extremely important. 
But at the same time, the reason that I went rogue and uh, I never thought about it that way, but yeah, I did go rogue because there was a set of uh, talking points that we were given and we were supposed to follow those talking points. And if you t uh, stayed within that box of the talking points, then you, you were safe. I didn't stay inside the box of the talking points because the talking points didn't answer my questions and they did not make sense within the full totality of what had just happened to the American people. So um, I did go rogue. That's right. I, I did. And, and I guess I should be proud of that. <laughs> but it was very really painful. Proud. We are proud but of that. But it was painful. I because, know. you know, but, you know, and so now um, I get um, messages. I should see if I can try and find it. But um, I get messages from people who tell me uh, I didn't. I didn't believe you. I better uh, not do anything, so I, I might lose the connection. But the connection. I didn't. Yeah, I, I I didn't believe you, and they tell me this. I mean, I knew it because I could hear it in radio programs across the U.S. and even people who had supported me. The heat came down on them. Uh, so hard, like Dennis Bernstein, who was at KPFA, he just dropped me in the fat. So even the people who supported me stopped supporting me because, you know, they were leaned on quite heavily to stay within the box of conformity around we were hit because we are free. Well, the narrative was, was false. And um, the whole idea that we're free. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the first <laughs> that was the first clue, right? <laughs> that something was amiss, something was a foul. <laughs> so I and, and so this is what I said in numerous um interviews that I did later was that I knew I wasn't free and I knew my constituents were free. We're so how free. could I go and tell them that they're free and that we were hit? Hit because we were free. So, you know, but anyway, now it's like, what, 20 years later almost. And um, I only now am I beginning to uh, receive messages saying, I get it now. I, 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 I believe the hype about you. I believed mm -hmm. that you were this and that you were that. And, you know, I, 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 I have... <clears throat> Uh, very good critical thinking skills. And I blame the Catholic Church for that. Well, not the church, but the schools, because um, I went to Catholic schools, and one of the things that they instilled in us, well, they, they instill values in us with mm -hmm. the nuns. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was in that environment. I never knew what was going on. I mean, I didn't know the other part of it. But uh, but likewise, um, <laughs> yeah. like myself, and you know, it's quite a okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're like but, we've got two uh, separate churches going on here. I think I don't exactly, know. exactly. But I went to these schools, and one of the values they instilled was if you have a talent, then you have to use that talent. To help other people. That's one of the. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I, I went from uh, first grade up to high school. Almost went to Catholic college. Um, you know, so I, I was steeped in that mass every Friday. You know the drill. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so and so I was steeped in that. And then the uh, secondly was that this um, the, the not just the ability to remember facts and figures, but to think your way through a situation was the, I guess, I think that was the, the prize mm -hmm. of the Catholic education that I received, was that I could think myself through a situation and then, uh, because of my values, if I could do that, then that was not something that I should keep to myself. I should, I should share with other people to help other people. So anyway, um, that's just 
what I was doing. So I had learned because of my focus on international relations, my undergrad was in international relations, my graduate studies were in international relations. And so I learned to read newspapers. It was what I did as a joy, as a pleasure to read newspapers from around the world. So I, you know, and the wonders of the internet make it so that you can literally travel around the world just by a few clicks. When George W. Bush said, I click around, well, uh, that was the embodiment of me. I clicked around. <laughs> and what I learned, though, in the aftermath of September 11th was that what um, U.S. newspapers and news outlets were reporting was vastly different from what the international community was learning about what had happened. So for example, um, in the international press, I learned that uh, there were warnings from several countries that had come in and into the Bush administration. We don't know, I, you know, did they just fall into a black hole? Did they get sucked up in the black hole? And with George Bush not wanting an investigation, this increased the uh, sense of culpability of the administration for not paying attention to the things that protect the people of the U.S. So um, there were that, you know, there were uh, the, the revelations about the war games, which eventually I was able to pose to um, <clears throat> the Pentagon through my position on the, uh, in the Congress. So there, there, were, there was this knowledge that was out there that was literally being funneled away from the US public. But I, because I click around on the internet, I was able to understand that. And we're coming hot off the heels, remember, of the election fraud, because that was pure election fraud that took place in 2000 with the presidential election. And Jeb Bush saying, just hold on, uh, we're going to get there and Florida having already been called for whoever the Democratic nominee was. I guess it was Al Gore at the time. Yeah, it was Al Gore and Florida having already been called for Al Gore. And then all of a sudden the magic flip happens and you get one precinct in Florida that has minus 16,000 votes. Now, how that happens in the tabulation with these electronic voting machines, I don't know. Well, actually, that was, at that time, that, there weren't even electronic voting machines. That was prior to their deployment. Uh, that was just with the hanging chats. But the machines were not set. This is uh, from computer specialists who actually were hired to understand what had happened. And I, you know, people talk to me. And so um, I found out that one of the machines was set at the beginning of the day to minus 16,000 votes. That, and that was one of the factors that contributed to the flipping of Florida. So um, we know that election fraud, fraud takes place. Election fraud took place in my own uh, two election so-called defeats, but it was election fraud. It was election theft. I didn't have any choice but to go along with it because nobody was willing to fight with me. No one was willing to fight for me. And I didn't have the money to fight for myself. So I ended up leaving the Congress. Now, in leaving the Congress, what had happened in carefully, a carefully orchestrated departure from Congress, the Iraq war at the same time was going on. And so then what happened was the country was actually involved in a debate which was necessary about U.S. involvement in wars against Iraq. Because remember, we had, we had done this before. We had done this dance before. And that was with George Herbert Walker Bush against Iraq. And I stayed up all night that night watching as the bombs were launched against Iraq. And a lot of people believed it. A lot of people believed the hype. But you see, I come from a part of the country, I'm Southern. 
I'm African American. I understand the history of my country. Is that, yes, this is my country too. And I understand its history. And I know that people have lied to get into wars. And uh, I have this wonderful t-shirt by Julian, uh, by WikiLeaks or Julian Assange says, if, uh, if, uh, if wars are started by lies, then peace can be started by truth. And um, yeah, it's wonderful. And so I, I, you know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, just because of my history, the uh, ugly, soft underbelly of my country as well. Oh, yeah. So um, when all of this is happening, and, uh, and then of course I was a PhD candidate at the time, so you get uh, um, Condoleezza Rice, saying, oh, that was in the footnotes, and I didn't read the footnotes. Now, I know any PhD, but I, now, of course, with the university scandal, we, underwear, we are aware that um, we understand that a lot of these uh, uh, slots are being purchased. So we get that. You know, probably they always were, but now it's, you know, sort of proliferated. But anyway, so any PhD worth their salt starts with the footnotes. Mm -hmm. They start with the index. The detail. And then they go backwards, right? Because you want to understand the nature of the references and, and whether or not those references themselves are even credible. Right. So this is again from my sort of Catholic, you know, thinking, which at the time I was just a, a, a PhD candidate. I wasn't, you know, the full-fledged PhD as I am now. So I think I'm looking at all of these very flimsy excuses that are coming along. And um, so I, I, I just say, okay, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not going to be down for bombing Iraq. No, George W. Bush, we're not going to bomb Iraq. So you've got the election fraud that took place in 2000, of, of, of which Roger Roger Stone was a big part, <laughs> which is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then you have uh, 2001. And then after 2001 happens, then you have this conflation of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein is the one that, you know, is responsible for 2001. We got to strike back. And uh, we, you know, uh, the, U the people of the U.S. find themselves paying for the Iraq war, uh, another Iraq war. Now, the Democratic Party, <clears throat> through the DCCC, which also now is, uh, has come into some prominence, the DCCC was busy trying to recruit people to run against me because the DCCC, the, the Democratic Party, is pro-war. That's why when they got me the first time in 2002 election, I said, I said that the Republicans wanted to beat me more than the Democrats wanted to keep me. Because what had happened was the Democrats had joined the war party. Those wars had been started by George Herbert Walker Bush, a rock war started by George Herbert Walker Bush. The idea was that these were Republican wars. Well, what had happened within the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party hierarchy and the financiers of the Democratic Party also were part of the deep state, military, industrial, congressional, banking, media complex. And so they wanted the wars as well. And they wanted that particular war. And even if it meant stripping us of our constitutional rights in the Patriot Act, that they were willing to do that in order to have their wars. Okay, so I know I've put a lot of things on the table here, but let me just finish this. <clears throat> Please. And so what happened to me was that <clears throat> Uh, so the Democratic Party is counting its votes to finance the Iraq war. 
And they know that because of this entire national dialogue that is taking place across the U.S., that the vote is going to be very tight. They also know, my fellow Democrats also knew that I was a sure no vote for the financing of the Iraq the authorization as well as the financing of the Iraq war. And so um, that's what precipitated them besides, you know, going rogue on 911 and the election and everything else. Um, so uh, that precipitated the um, search of the DCCC to find someone to replace me as uh, the, the, those people in uh, Charlottesville, West Virginia was saying, we will not be replaced. Okay, well, uh, I was replaced. Yes, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so by the time 2000, and the, the vote came in 2007, and I was not in the Congress to cast that vote against financing the Iraq war. The war. Guess how, <clears throat> by how many votes, the Iraq war financing bill passed? Don't tell me one. The bill passed with only the required number of votes, 218. Which means that had I been in the Congress, not replaced by Rahm Emanuel, and his cohort at the DCCC, the bill to finance the Iraq war would have failed. By one and vote. And we, the Your people vote. of the United States, would be having a different conversation right now. One so vote. So one vote does count. One, every vote counts. One vote can make the difference. And we've been engaged in these wars ever since. Mm. But it was because the DCCC Oh, and the Democratic Party, along with the media and other Republicans, they were united in one thing. We want to have this war against Iraq because the Iraq war is the stepping stone for us to completely dismantle the entire region. And that, of course, is what we're seeing now. Cynthia, there's, there's so much in what you just said. Um, I want to take back, go back to your mention of Roger Stone real, real quick, because it's, it's uh, so controversial. Tell us what you meant by that. Well, what I meant was Roger Stone is the one that went down there and orchestrated uh, for the Republic, on behalf of the Republic, went to, to Florida, sorry. This is 2000. Right. So uh, Roger Stone appears, he goes down there and uh, makes sure that there's damage control is done for uh, the Republican Party in, in the counting and the recounting of the dangling chads. Remember the, the hanging chads and the dangling, whatever the, you know, they got. <laughs> so um, uh, that, that, that was the role that Roger Stone uh, played there. And, uh, so basically, even at that point, and this is when I understood the nature of the Democratic Party, <clears throat> having not truly been an anti-war party, because um, the Democratic Party could have and should have uh, requested a recount of the state of Florida. But instead, in a very flawed but controlled kind of way, what the Democrats did was they asked for recounts in certain areas of Florida. And that, of course, led to <clears throat> the entire fiasco of uh, what was the, uh, the Supreme Court decision at the time and uh, the Supreme Court decision that should not be taken as a precedent now it's not a precedent, but we are going to make a decision here in favor of stopping the, the recount. Well, they didn't need to stop it because the Democrats had already stopped it. I mean, you know, honestly, the Democrats 
were part and parcel of, of the problem there. And the Democrats did not fight for the right of, <clears throat> there were two infractions that took place in Florida. One of those infractions against the African-American voters was the ability to cast a vote. The second infraction against those same African-American voters was the ability to have the vote counted. So the two most important in election infractions were not fought <clears throat> by the Democratic Party. They went through the motions, very similar to what Theresa May in the UK is doing now with Brexit. The people of the UK voted for Brexit, but they cannot, they could never, the system is flawed, or you could say the system is rigged, because you should never expect the people who are against the will of the people to carry out the will of the people. So it was a conservative party that was against Brexit to start with. Remember, that's how we got Theresa May in the first place, because David Cameron said, well, if you vote for Brexit, I'm going to resign. And, the, and he thought that, you know, he was, you know, hot stuff. And so I never thought that would people, happen. <laughs> and, and the people voted for Brexit anyway. <laughs> In the same way that they had voted for Grexit, and, you know, before that. So there's something uh, about um, having a small group of people control your destiny. No, nobody wants that to happen. Everybody wants at least to have the appearance of being the master of their faith. And so uh, if we are not the masters of our faith, then we've got to have a revolution so that we can become so. And um, the revolution, in fact, though, in the United States, as well as in Europe, is going the other way. It's going toward more and more centralization and denial of individual in identities. It's important to, I was, I just happened to have been in Italy during the time that um, the uh, Italians were switching from the lira to uh, the, the euro. And nobody wanted it. Nobody, I mean, they hated it. The prices went up, you know. And, uh, but, and, and, and so, uh, so now to be, yes, there was a shared identity, but there are ways in which you can share your identity and not give up your identity at the same time. <laughs> and so that's why this gets back to, you know, my whole idea about, you know, I'm from the South. And so I am from a part of the country that is misunderstood and mislabeled. And is mislabeled and misunderstood by those very same people who sit on their high horses and think that they have the answers for my, for my problems. No, they don't have the answers to my problems. And so you can't get a bunch of, um, <clears throat> this is why, you know, during the, the um, Confederate memorial argument, I think it's pretty much over now. But um, during the time when that was thought to be a wedge issue for the Democrats, uh, I had to go rogue again. Why? Because I'm Southern. And the, uh, those monuments are as much a part of my history yes. as they are a part of the, um, the, the, the people who enslaved me and my, you know, my ancestors. Okay, so now if you have a problem with the monuments, let's have a discussion about the narrative around the monument. Let's begin the process of healing by talking about what those monuments mean. I do not want those monuments destroyed because they are integral to the story and the transformation that has taken place in the South that has not yet taken place in other parts of the country. And so that's why you have, say for example, in California, more segregation than you had in the 1950s in the South, in the school system out in, Cal in, in California, according to 
some studies that have been done. So um, I, I believe that in many ways, um, the, uh, uh, the South at least was forced to have the conversation. And when we, and, and when we find people who have experienced and been through that conversation, then we also have people who have trans have been through a transformation. Yes, triumph. So this is also why I know that personal and individual transformation is possible. I am very reticent, and it's true. There are some people who are so beyond, you know, the times that they will never change. But um, I never. Uh, doubt the ability of people to think and feel and change. And that's what we have had in the South more than in any other part of the country. So, for example, when I went to university, to, uh, no, my, cal my, uh, my undergrad was out in California. But when I did my graduate studies for my master's, I was in Boston and I was appalled because Boston was going through the, the school desegregation situation, you would have thought you were in Little Rock, Arkansas, because the people, were, you know, I literally was afraid to cross the street in Boston. There were um, uh, kids from my school, from at my institution, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, one of the premier international relations diplomacy studies <laughs> institutions <laughs> in the country. <laughs> Um, uh, and and uh, I got there on merit, on my brain. Right. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, buy your I, way I, in. Uh, <laughs> to pay for, for me to get there. But anyway, so um, uh, the kids, the uh, kids from the, the black kids and the African students that were there, because it's an international school, so people from all over the world go there. And uh, they were literally beaten up by the townies. And, and so it was left to me to go to the administration and tell them, look, it's dangerous for us, it's dangerous for us to be here. <laughs> you know? And, and, and uh, Boston was, I mean, Boston, the place where the, you know, the height of uh, erudition in the United States is going and, and treating people that way. So, no, um, I'm a proud Southerner, and I understand the, um, the importance of having a discussion around the narratives, which has led me to this idea, which I don't have the money to uh, carry out. And that was when I was with uh, Robert David Steele, that I said, okay, so now how can, because eventually, I should say, that my PhD is in leadership and change. Well, this is exactly what is embodied in my uh, experience as a Southerner, that there were some people who took the mantle of leadership, they assumed the, ma the mantle of leadership, and in my home uh, city of Atlanta, we didn't go through, say, for example, what happened in Birmingham, where, which is where my mom is from. So we, we, we did not have the Alabama experience. We did not have the uh, Mississippi experience in Georgia because there were some people who said, okay, let's have a negotiated peace. And um, now I'm fully aware of the entirety of the context of that. But the fact nonetheless is that the city of Atlanta became the hub of transportation in the South because during that moment of explosive growth, the city of Atlanta was not mired in what Birmingham and um, Gulfport and other places in Mississippi were. That's a fact. And, and, and so even to this day, the city of Atlanta's airport is the world's busiest airport for a reason, and it stems from that legacy of having that negotiated peace. So um, what that all put together, along with my studies at, at the PhD level, indicate is that it is possible there's something called change theory, and leaders are able to lead 
or leave planned change or manage unplanned change and still find a way to achieve the desired outcomes. So now, <clears throat> uh, what I would like to do as a project, I call it the power cells. And so basically in every state we would have a power cell and we would create the context around which we can have this narrative. And finally, we can have a, a, a real narrative because you see, you and I, even though we're women, we're not supposed to uh, find commonality because I'm black and you're not black. So um, we're supposed to be separated. Cynthia, and if what we do you make of that, let me ask you a question. What do you make of the, the current, because the history that you have and the knowledge that you have is extraordinary. And because you speak from the heart, I, I do, think, yeah. I think everyone gets it. Everyone is pure on what you're saying because there are many people, frankly, that don't speak from the heart when they speak on the That's subjects true. that you've been talking They speak about. from the talking points. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, 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 say, they say the words you're saying, but it's not from the same place as it's coming from with you. Now, we've come so far since the days, say, of, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King. Let's just take it back to there. We've come mm -hmm. a really long way, and it seemed like everything was going really well, I'll say. You know, um, it's not mm -hmm. perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Yes, right, you can have right. white people with problems and black people and Muslim right. problems and everything. Right. But it seems to me, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but it seems to me that the Democratic platform has taken on this opinion um, or uh, illustration of a huge amount of dividedness. You know, that we're now talking about white supremacy all the time. And we're talking about, you know, the, the fear of, of Muslims. And we're talking about, which in some cases in the United States, I'll be honest, there is, tr is real. The reason I'm bringing this up is that um, when we're recording this, the day after your birthday, the day after um, <laughs> <laughs> St. Patrick's Day, um, Judge Janine Pirro has just gotten, I, I, you know, I, I think she's on extended leave because of something that she said about Representative Omar. And she questioned her, mm -hmm. is your alliance with the United States Constitution or is it with Sharia law, your Muslim religion? Mm -hmm. Tell me what your thoughts are because of what has happened in London. We are Americans. We go to the Constitution. <clears throat> and um, not only did that happen, but then they've brought in um, the DNC former chairwoman, Donna Brazile. Um, mm -hmm. They just did that this week, just today. I think she made her premiere on Fox News. Who, who brought in Donna Brazile? Fox News. Okay. So they That's just not surprising. Hide. Isn't that interesting? Now, talk to us about number one, the, the what's happening with the Muslim, the dividedness. Um, I think, I think, I think people right now they want to know what's going on from someone from your perspective, someone who, as I said before, created the alternative media, created the truth-seeking <laughs> media. Really, we are here to seek yeah. the truth. And if the mainstream news won't do it, and if Fox has now turned on us, which I hope they haven't, but let's just say, you know, there's a lot well, of... Maybe, may, maybe the, mis, the, the, the misapprehension is that Fox belonged to you to start with. Maybe Fox was never yours to start with. You and, I, and so... Um, I think it's very important for us to understand maybe the intent behind my language. So, for example, when I say that the war party encompasses both Democrat and Republican parties, that also goes, extends to their media. Now, um, so CNN is pro-war, Fox is pro-war. Um, and now... <clears throat> The question that I would pose to Ms. Pirro is what does she say about the Zionists who are upfront 
in their uh, desire to have the U.S. fight the wars on behalf of Israel. What does she say about that? Because Zionist control of that narrative is true and it results in U.S. policy. Now, what I happen to believe um, is that the people of the United States are being hyped up to hate communism, to hate uh, socialism, to hate Muslims, just to hate. And, and it's exactly the same phenomenon that took place with me, that I was the butt of both Democrat and Republican media outlets. Why? Because I went rogue and I, uh, utilizing my critical thinking skills, understood that there was another danger and my and that the the true danger was them okay so now you want to talk about muslims being inside the united states well if there are muslims in the united states let's also take a look at what u.s policy is toward certain countries of the muslim world the united states today literally as you and i speak mm -hmm. on the day after my birthday bombing Yemen or aiding and abetting in the bombing of Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And there's probably some more, but, um, oh, Syria for crying out loud, <laughs> Syria, <laughs> uh, Iraq, the uh, U.S. said they're not going to leave Iraq and has totally destroyed Libya. What do those seven, and now their aims um, to put as targets Lebanon and Iran. Now you tell me, what do those wars have to do with my ability to represent the good people of Stone Mountain, Georgia? Where's the benefit right. to my next door neighbor? Right. For, uh, for the U.S. The bombing Somalia. Where is the benefit to my community for the United States bombing and destroying Yemen? Where is the benefit to my state of Georgia for the U.S. to destroy Libya? Where is the benefit for we the people of the United States to destroy Pakistan? You tell me. No so one. Now, yeah, no one in our country if, wants that. And that's what. Well, so yes, they do. Yes, well, they do. Yes, they do. The political. Because leader. if you are not a part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. So if you are wavering on the sidelines and say, oh, I, it's easy for me to hate those people because they deserve those bombs. Right, because that is the circular kind of thinking that's being promoted. You know, it's you're not right. right, huh? Cynthia, you know what? You are absolutely right because I remember having discussions not even a long time ago, but there are people that simply because they hear on the news someone the Russians are our enemies, yes, or whoever is our enemies. You know, we hate them. You know, we, you know, you've never even, you've met, you've never met them. You know nothing about right. them. You're basing your hate upon what you've heard, frankly, in the mainstream media, these stories. Right. The, the same lying so media. You are, you are so accurate. You know, my. Let my, me add to that. Let me yes, just add a story. Yes. yes. I am, even though I guess we're running out of time. but No, we're not. I, you keep going. I, okay. I, you are extraordinary. So I'm, I'm, I'm back home in Georgia, in Stone Mountain, and um, I'm at the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm standing in line, and people can't believe it's me. And say, is that you? Ooh. You know, like that. You know, I get that all the time. And sometimes it's <laughs> a traffic jam at the, at the gas station, you know? But um, so I'm, I'm in the grocery store standing in line to check out with my few items. And this black lady turns to me and says, you know, I think Putin is just trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. 
Now, she didn't know what to say to me, but she wanted to say something to me. But she had heard that in the media. And so then she wants to show that she can have a very enlightened conversation with me. And so then she, she parrots what she has heard. Exactly. And so that we've got a lot of that going on. So I would ask those people who are afraid of Muslims to go get to no one and then investigate how they came and why they came to the U.S., those uh, that are there. Mm. By the same token, I would ask them to investigate why the United States treasure of young people and Cohen is being spent prosecuting wars in parts of the world where most people don't even, can't even uh, identify them on a map. Instead, what I think we should be focused on is the U.S. Constitution and that we should judge our leaders and the people we vote for by, uh, based on their commitment to the U.S. Bill of Rights. Absolutely. And people are so under the guise of patriotism. Um, people get so enraptured that they're willing to just, you know, practically beg the government to go bomb other portions of our world. It's and that's very sad. Wow. We should be trying to make friends with other parts of the world. And in the, in the course, you see, in the course of, this is what I was telling my students the other day, is that uh, one of the things that I have always felt is, one, that U.S. foreign policy should be guided and directed as a, you know, uh, based on our commitment to human rights. And then the second thing is that uh, we need to define national security in a different kind of way. Because if we, the people of the U.S., are insecure, then one of those stools upon which our national security rests, uh, one of the legs of the stool um, is missing. And right now, uh, we've got boil water uh, um, orders coming out of cities, out of municipalities and uh, localities because our water infrastructure is poor. We've got um, transportation infrastructure poor. We've got uh, sewage infrastructure poor. We've got people who are um, suffering, in, particularly like in the uh, southern part of Alabama. We've got diseases that, that uh, should not exist in a so-called developed country. We've got homelessness out of the wazoo. And the Democratic Party is telling us that we should allow, um, we should allow, we should invite non-citizens to come in and actually be able to vote in uh, local elections. I mean, this is just, I mean, there's madness all around and we've got to take stock of, this is what I said after September 11th. I said, we need to take stock of who we are as a country and what we stand for in the world. Cynthia, you are so full of such incredible knowledge, history, perspectives. Um, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for coming on this show. Please tell everybody, I know you're in Bangladesh teaching right now. How can everyone follow your work? Uh, I'm, I have a very vibrant uh, social media. Uh, well, actually, I'm in Facebook jail, to be honest. <laughs> uh, Facebook put me in jail. But my son, thank goodness for young people, was able to maneuver a little thing. And, you know, so I'm out on the lamb right now. <laughs> uh, so I'm posting on Facebook at Cynthia McKinney Official. There are many Cynthia McKinneys, but the only one that's official, officially me, is Cynthia McKinney Official. I'm on Twitter uh, as Cynthia McKinney. And then I have my website, which I, uh, is woefully behind. And I need to figure out how to, you know, I'm learning. I'm still learning. We're all, you know, uh, God is still working on all of us, right? You know, so we're all still works in progress. And so I'm learning how to be a better uh, webmaster for myself. And my uh, website is allthingscynthiamckinney.com. And there you can go and you can see the 
the behavioral science background for my power cells idea. Uh, there's a lot of things that are still that are there that are still good. And I would encourage people to go there. And there's a little chat um, function that if you send me a message, then I'll get back to you. Um, it may take me a while, but I'll get back to you. And then there's always the contact. If you use the contact function, um, then I will get back to you quicker than I will on the little chat, but it's there. And uh, I love interacting with people because it's the only way I can learn. Wonderful. Well, this has been such an honor to have you on this show. And we desperately need people that shoot straight. Just tell it the way they see it, not for any other reason except that it's the truth. And we honor you. And it's been a real privilege to have you on this show. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, you, you're right. I'm a straight shooter. But uh, here's the thing. I hope that your audience, which is an audience that's vastly different than, say, my normal, regular audience, I hope that, they, that their hearts are at least open or their brains are open to what I've had to say and that they can um, sort of maybe see the world from my vantage point and then join it with theirs and we create something beautiful together. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Cynthia McKinney, American politician, activist, and teacher. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. In March, we already released Mark Faber, who called the bottom on Bitcoin at $4,000. And you can access his research at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Faber. David Stockman, who is warning to get the hell out of the markets. His full warning is available at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash David. Charles Hugh Smith, who talks about the new America, rich and homeless living side by side. Read it all at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Smith. And a no-holds-barred interview with Bob Moriarty. He really went hard on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You can go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Bob for the details. We also plan on releasing one of the bombshell interviews of the year, conducted with David Stockman. We also just released interviews with the man who exposes the deep state and the shenanigans of Washington better than anybody else, Robert David Steele. And I highly suggest going to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Robert. Of course, for the most accurate information on Cynthia McKinney's latest invest, go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash C. It's essential reading.